Okay, so yesterday I'm driving and my phone falls between my legs and all of a sudden I hear, hello, hello, and it's Jason Begay. And I'm like, oh my God, Jason, I think my legs just dialed you. He goes, mm, I like that. <laughs> well, enough about you. Did he say anything about me? Oh my God. We're better together with Anne and Heather. Hi, everybody. Thank you for listening to Better Together with Ann and Heather. Welcome. <laughs> You're about to listen to our interview with Jason Begay. I, I was a little bit smitten with him, I think. I, I know. He's so cute. I think he made me blush. And don't, <laughs> I couldn't have ever admitted that on set. I think I would have been sued for harassment or something. But just a cool guy. Just so, so beautiful. And if you listen to this interview, you'll find out how the most unlazy man in Chicago calls himself lazy. That's right. <laughs> Which is hilarious. He talks about how he got David Duchovny into acting. <laughs> oh, talks. Yeah. About Scientology with a very unique perspective. Uh, I, um, yes. Uh, something and, he's not involved with anymore. And but. Uh, we become the driver of our own car. So please uh, listen to our interview with Jason Begay. My friend, the incomparable Jason Begay. <laughs> You are a singular voice. You are a, m a man of deep and thoughtful word. And I have to say, I'm uh, so happy to introduce you to Heather. And uh, Heather, I have some news for you because we are popping Jason's cherry today in a, in a way that may not be what he uh, will you normally think of. This is your first podcast, my friend. Is that <laughs> correct? We couldn't uh, be happier. Well, welcome. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Jason uh, Begay is an actor and a producer. We all know him as Sergeant Hank Voigt from Chicago PD. He's played that character on five different shows. He has an entire have, body of wow. work, way too many to list, but some of his highlights include Thelma and Louise, G.I. Jane, Law and Order SVU. And if there's the word Chicago in it, most likely Jason has been on that show. <laughs> Chicago That's Fire, true. Chicago PD, Chicago Med, Chicago Justice. <laughs> Chicago Hope. <laughs> so we That's welcome true. Jason into the Better Together fold. Oh, welcome, welcome. I guess we could call you Mr. Chicago. Hi, Jason. It's, hi, dear, my darling. Uh, I I think you are in Chicago and have shared. Um, there are there. It's different weather there in Chicago, is it not? Yes, it's uh, brisk. <laughs> it's, uh, yeah, I I mean I wish I could take you outside. I mean there is like frozen mountains. Of oh snow. God. Oh my God! So, Jason, let's uh, let's just jump in with a celebration of of what you have done for the city of Chicago, but um, nurturing a, a cast into the tremendous success of eight seasons on Chicago PD. Can you tell us a bit about how just how that happened? I it's so difficult to wrap our heads around um, the, being able to do a job for that long a period of time with such such success as, as you have. How did that happen for you? Well, it happened. It was actually, it was, it's a kind of a, I mean, do you want the short or the long? We want the long, man. We're All here right, to talk to you. The long version, it's interesting, is, you know, both, when I was a kid, I used to go to Chicago all the time because my parents grew up here and their parents were still here. So when I was a little boy, I'd go from New York to Chicago. So I have and I have all this kind of roots here uh, in Chicago and Illinois. And. Uh, but I grew up in New York and my grandparents died and I lived my life and I became an actor and all this stuff. And I got this call. My mother had just died and my father was dying. He was, you know, dying of a broken heart mm. or no. And he, he had just died too. Actually, he died like a couple months after my mom. And in that period between the death and the funeral, and he was living in DC. They were, had been living in DC. And uh, I got a call that Dick Wolf wanted me to come on to Chicago fire to do three episodes of this new show that he had. And I looked it over, okay. And it was one of those things. And uh, and he was a you know, very mean, scary guy. And I thought, okay, that sounds fun. And- uh, Your character was mean and scary? Oh yeah. Uh -huh. And uh, very intimidating, very, you know, scary cop. But it, it uh, I, uh, the day I put my father in the ground, 
I went back to their house where my parents had lived. I grabbed my bag and I had to get on a flight to shoot the first day of Chicago Fire as this three-part guest star. And uh, it turned into 15 episodes, the last of which was a backdoor pilot for uh, Chicago PD. And I'd always thought that my parents would have gotten such a kick, you know, out of it, you know, this whole Chicago thing. But uh, that that's that's how it happened, really. And uh, and I think the the way that the show, you know, if I really had the answer of what made it successful, then I'd be the richest man in TV because <laughs> no, nobody knows those answers. But, uh, you know, I, I find it I, I like going to work still, you know, and I just like me, you know, I'm always trying to change and discover myself and uncover myself create myself maybe and uh so I feel like the same with the character you know and so I I'm he's evolving all this George Floyd stuff was a was a wake-up call for him and so I've got all this new stuff to deal with and and I don't know it's fun for me I I I like the guy you know I think of it like a relationship and we still get along, you know. <laughs> you know, we even sleep together sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> you mentioned so, that you have deep roots in Chicago, but it, it, tell us a little bit more about that because what you your your family was was it governor or what what were your my 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 name is Jason Deneen Begay, and my great grandfather Charles Deneen was the district attorney of Chicago. And, uh, you know, and he was a very honest politician, which is fairly rare, I I hear in this town. And then uh, he became governor and eventually senator of Illinois. And he was a he was very a man of integrity. And uh, he was he's good. There's even a little Charles Deneen uh, elementary school here. I think he was responsible for why there's so many parks in Chicago. He was when he said the people need a place to relax after all this hard work. And uh, so he, he was a pretty cool guy. But, uh, and, and my father's side, that's my mother's side. My father's father, uh, he came over from Italy and he became a, a ballet, I mean, a, the premier violinist in the Chicago symphony. And he was a, a sculptor and a painter. He's actually got a sculpture in the uh, in the Capitol. So are uh, they going to erect a statue to you in Chicago, Jason? I, I'm waiting. You know, I think they should get rid of that Jordan statue. Uh, clearly, I'm more important. Than, <laughs> Absolutely. Than, than, what I, was that guy's name again? Michael. Yeah, Wilson. what was that? Yeah, yeah. So are you, are you a Chicago guy now officially or? I am. I actually... Uh, you know, sadly was divorced and, you know, through a different series of different things and including a contract, I had to become a, I don't know why. I don't know if you guys actually read your contracts. You probably do, but I don't, <laughs> uh, you know, part of the deal was I had to become a uh, uh, Illinois resident. So I live, oh, I'm, wow. a, I'm an actual, uh, a, and I like it, you know, but uh, I love Chicago. Well, you clearly have taken on um, uh, the the humanity and our artistic prowess of of those who came before you. I think one of the things that's most stunning about you, Jason, is really your ambassadorship to to the folks that you brought on. When when you lead a show and you are given a group of young actors, you. I think probably feel a real responsibility uh, to them. And having been on the show, being so lucky to have uh, been able to work with you, I know you picked me. I know you picked me. Um, <laughs> I I saw what what kind of family it was. You kind of raised those actors, didn't you? Well, I mean, uh, I love them, and uh, I I I I think that they, you know, I like to pass on my experience and my viewpoint and I think they welcome it. Uh, but just like my own kids, you know, they're, they're better than I am. And 
you know, I, how much of that is nature and how much of it is nurture, I, I don't know. But I, uh, you know, one of the things I thought when, you know, I didn't have any clue about how to be a father. And I think one of the smartest things that I decided when I thought about it, and I failed consistently, but I think a good way to go about it that's worked for me is not what can I teach them, but what can I learn from them? Mm. And, uh, and, and, and you end up having, an, I think a better exchange that way, but they, <laughs> I, I, I tell you, I mean, there's each one of the relationships with my castmates are unique and it's definitely a give and a take, you know, I, I, I'm much better for them. And I hope they're better for me. Well, I just want everyone to know who's listening that uh, in my short time that I got to spend with you, each and every one of the cast members who are so lovely and gorgeous and welcoming pulled me aside at, at different moments and talked about the admiration they have for you and how much you've changed their life. And uh, having been in this business a really long time, it's so beautiful. Well, you've changed you changed mine and have bettered me. But to be able to have um, a, such a such a group that uh, understands you on and respects what you you've given them and, and and taught them and and I know that you you take that as a badge of honor and it, and it shows on your show. Well, um, I love truly. Them. Um, I we, that I, show got me to Chicago for the very first time. I had actually right. never been to Chicago, and uh, I got to go visit her when she was on the show, and it felt like at every corner of the street they were filming some sort of Chicago show like yeah. as we were walking through I'm like wait is that your show you're like no it's a different Chicago show well if there's ever right? sirens like you don't know if it's the show or That's somebody's true. getting arrested and, and it by, can't I'm, I'm, that would be really funny if they actually really arrested some of the people who were actually on the show that things get confused do you um, feel the responsibility I, I we spoke a little off camera about uh, this but the responsibility of what's going on in the world around you certainly in in Chicago and and uh, the store, but you're a cop show. Do you take on the stories of what has changed this season for you? That um, uh, do you feel the weight of it? Do you get involved in the storytelling of it? H how does that work out when there's such volatile things going on around you and in the press? Well, we, uh, I mean, I know that the producers and the network were nervous. Uh, I think even some cop shows got canceled and, mm -hmm. you know, and, and this is a show that's, you know, it's Chicago PD. It's, it's from the viewpoint of police, you know, and uh, so there was a lot of nerves. I was excited. I know that uh, the producer and the, the showrunner were also, we thought it was a wonderful kind of opportunity. And, uh, we, we, we were ready to jump into it, and, but we've been dealing with uh, race issues within the police department and race issues between the department and the community for a few years, really. Mm -hmm. And uh, even our final episode was this very charged uh, thing with uh, you know, our lead uh, African-American character, Atwater, you know, LaRoyce and uh, and he was in this, he was, he was being attacked within by white cops for not, you know, for standing up for a black perpetrator that was wrongly killed. Right. And, you know, he wasn't going to toe the line, which is, I guess, kind of par for the course. And it's a, it, and it's a whole interesting, I mean, it's, a, you know, it's, so we try, I mean, on the show, I mean, one of the things that we do is try to, live by the mantra that everybody is right it and, and so if you can you know the racist is right from his viewpoint i gotta do this and 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 we try to get into maybe how somebody got there so we try to show what is and and hopefully people can watch and make a you know their own decision about that um but Clearly, because of what's going on, you know, all of our characters have had to adjust. And my guy is, you know, kind of very savage and very my way. And, 
he doesn't self-reflect. He's, he's extremely like in this moment, you know, just a hungry eat, you know, but he has a lot of, uh, you know, integrity and honor. And, and he, so here he is having to, you know, second guess himself. So it's been an interesting thing. You know, he never questioned, I'm going to fucking do this, you know, because I'm going to save that little girl, but I'm going to break all these rules yeah. and crack this guy's head because it's, you know, this guy's a piece of shit and this is a 12 year old girl. So he doesn't think about it. So now he's forced to, you know, it, so it's a, it's a, so that's interesting and, and, and fun, you know, and I, I actually, I started the season, you know, we obviously also had this, this minor pandemic and, uh, <laughs> You know, I don't know about you, but it, it really hit me in the knees at first because I was like, I was in the middle of shooting, you know, and you know what that's like. And I, I was in episode, I don't know what, 20 maybe out of, you know, so I'm like, like at the last half mile of a marathon and, and I'm going and then all of a sudden, boom, you're done. And I'm alone in this big apartment and 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 I, I started having a weird emotional things. And then, you know, I started looking at what's going on and I thought, oh, this is good. You know, and I tried to kind of lean into it. You know, I figured like, okay, my character's knees are going to have to hit the ground. Let me see if I can find a way to, you know, take a look and and experience things that might not be that comfortable for me. So, you know, and that's the cool thing about acting. You know, it's like there's always an opportunity to to rip off a piece of bread and Mm -hmm. get all the gravy off the plate. You know, when, when, you know, there's no bad feelings, it's just another, they may be uncomfortable, but you know, it's just a cool color that I now have to paint with. Well, we're going to take a quick little break. And when we come back, we're going to hear what makes Jason uncomfortable if he is a rule breaker himself and what got him to the glorious uh, role of uh, Voight um, when we come back. We're better together with Anne and Heather. All right, welcome back. Um, Jason, uh, I would say you're a kindred spirit in, in diving as deep as you can into uh, your own soul so that your characters can reveal the soul of, of, of others. Would you consider yourself a rule breaker in life? Uh, I probably am. Maybe because uh, I don't really think about rules. I don't know what the <laughs> rules are, you know. I, I don't know. I I I, uh, I I think I I am. I can tell you that uh, he, he, I mean, interestingly, you know. I mean, I grew up in the '60s and '70s, and uh, and started in the business, you know, in the '80s, and uh, it was a different world. And, How did you uh, get into acting? All my life, everybody always said you should be an actor. And I, I had no idea what the hell that meant. And then I had this really, uh, really f- fabulous mentor uh, who was my uh, life mentor. And the very important to me, French guy, he's called me Bebe. And he and he said and he said what what are you gonna do, baby? I was probably eighteen or so, seventeen, eighteen. I, said, I don't know. I'll do something. He said, "Oh, you're gonna be an actor." I'm like, he said, "Oh yeah." And I'm like, huh? But then I kind of got discovered, and I was supposed to go. Uh, I became a model, and I'm like, I'm not that tall, and I didn't know what a model was. And uh, so I looked at GQ magazine and this is like 1977, eight. And, and, and I'm looking at it and it's like all these guys going, you know, I look good in this sport coat. And, <laughs> and, and I just didn't have the, 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 the balls to do that. And I was like, these guys are expecting, you know, cause they want, you're going to Italy to do this thing. And I, I didn't know how to do it, but I, I grew up on art books. And, I, and, and so I remember this book that I had always loved my whole life that was in my father's library, which was called The Family of Man. 
And it's a beautiful book of photographs of people in real situations. And, uh, and so I thought those pictures are more interesting than these. And I could do that. And so I went to Europe. And instead of like standing there going, you want to fuck me, don't you? <laughs> uh, I, I would go, OK, I'm standing here because I'm waiting at the bus to go to the loony bin to pick up my mother. <laughs> interesting. I, you gave it a I, whole backstory. And and every and and I, I within a month I was the Armani man, and they were the piccolo actore. Everybody actor 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 and 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 it just from there I just and I I never had to wait a table. I just I had boundless oh, wow. confidence, you know. Also, I said I can do that, you know. That's easy. I can tell that story. Well, that's rare. Well, uh, did it, did you then go to school? I've uh, we've we've heard a bit about your 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 New York days and maybe those uh, the the gentlemen that you used to hang with. The gentlemen, uh, <laughs> lots of lot of people. Well, but, you went. Did you go do a? Did you go back then from from modeling and, and yeah, go yeah, I, to I went acting back school? To New York after a couple of years in Europe, and I went and I studied. I. I I actually knew this guy who used to date my sister. He's now a very big time lawyer. He was the assistant district attorney of the Bronx at the time, but he, he became a big isn't Rudy Giuliani, is it? <laughs> and, uh, and I ran into him and he says, uh, he says, I want you to meet my friend, Antonio. Oh, that's how I became a, oh no, but he was, holy shit. I just realized something. This, uh, this lawyer, Ed Hayes, He's why I became a model, because he introduced me to Antonio, who was the greatest fashion illustrator of the, of the time. And, uh, and he introduced me to, you know, Bruce Weber and boom. And wow. then, and, and uh, but I, I asked Ed Hayes, I came back and I said, you know, I'm thinking about maybe everybody says I should be an actor. What, what, what class do I go to? And apparently he asked Robert De Niro, who was my favorite actor at the time, maybe still, I don't know. I certainly love his work and him, but, uh, <laughs> uh, and he gave me the name of this guy, Wynn Hanman. And I said, okay, and they were all working actors. And so I met him and he gave me a, he said, pick a scene and, and do a scene for me. And I remember my best friend, David Duchovny, who was, you know, just my buddy at the time, you know, he wasn't an actor. I, helped him make that decision. But the, uh, the, uh, uh, we're going over on the Crosstown bus and I'm doing this scene. It's a monologue from Sam Shepard, I think it was. And I thought it was really fucking serious and I'm doing my best and we're working it on the bus, you know, I'm making sure I know my lines and he's waiting for me outside and we're gonna go do whatever we do. And, uh, and I go in, it was so, this is a great experience. So I go in to do my serious fucking monologue for Win Hanman, and he's fucking howling. I didn't even know it was a funny monologue, but I was so serious. He just thought I was the funniest fucking thing in the world. Cause you know, you want to play comedies serious, you know, you don't play it like I'm funny, you know? <laughs> so at any rate, I killed it. And, uh, and, uh, and the, and then I, uh, after my first scene, which was Holden Caulfield, he, ex he uh, assigned to me with Kim Greist. And they were all working actors. Everybody thought I was great. And they said, and so I said, oh, thank you. You know, hey, uh, I think I want to try this. Can I meet your agents? And I signed with ICM. Did you ever think that your dreams of acting would lead you to be a paraplegic on Everwood and meet Anne Hage? <laughs> that, I knew from then on, it's been like a, a slow descent. <laughs> <laughs> do you yeah. do you remember do you remember that experience i do give you credit for i say there's a handful of actresses i'm sure who get put in front of the leads of shows and one of the uh things about being an actress you know you uh you you hope that the memories uh that you hold in your heart when you're moved by uh working with someone else uh have have the same impact and you and i met years ago on everwood and um, uh, that was a, that was a that was a trip. Um, it was such a funny uh, couple that we were. Can you please tell what well, it's I, like? I, the thing was, I I was there. I don't know how many episodes, maybe ten or something. <laughs> yeah. And I I only had one scene because 
I was just a foil for Anne because she <laughs> had all this stuff and she had this 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 husband who was in a wheelchair and he, I couldn't talk. I couldn't I couldn't do any. It was a, I, this is what I did for 10 episodes. <laughs> And, and, and so there I was, and except for I do remember there was a flashback memory and we had one scene and you were in the tub and that was definitely a highlight. <laughs> oh, that's funny. That's well, it. it's one of the most difficult things to do. Like Treat Williams was the lead of the show and it was, it was for lack of better term, somewhat moralistic, the show beautifully written by Greg Berlanti. Yeah, <laughs> Didn't yeah. give you any lines. <laughs> um, but it's... You know, it's hard enough to go on a show and be, be you know, a day player, basically, which is what I was. Um, and then even more difficult when you're put into a wheelchair and this poor guy has to watch the way they're justifying treat having a, a love interest is that my husband's paraplegic. So it's OK if I flirt. I'm like, the whole thing is so wrong. Yeah. Um, uh, but um, uh, of course, you and I got along great. Great. I just yes, felt it so perfect. it's just uh, our friend and where friendships uh, blossom is incredible. But but speaking of, of our moralistic uh, selves, I know you took a spiritual journey in the time that you were uh, growing as an actor. And there I mean, everyone knows you as, as a void, but the body of work that you have behind you and the, so many characters I also would be remiss if we didn't talk about your spiritual journey a little bit and, and choosing to, wh how did you choose your spiritual path that people have talked about with you going into Scientology? And do you mind talking about what that, uh, uh, what that choice was for you and when that came up in your, in your life? Well, uh, that was, a, again, like, I feel like my life, has always happened to me. I've never been an ambitious guy. I, I'm the most lazy person you've ever met. In the, until I got the role of Voight was the first time I ever worked hard. I mean, I was a big time wrestler in high school <laughs> and I smoked and shit, you know, I, and I just was not, I never allowed myself to do my best hmm. uh, wow. out of some fear, you know, probably. And I was always, you know, like a lot of actors, like, the job ends and they're like, Oh, I'll never work again. And I was always, Oh, good. I got a little money. I'm going to see, you know, get something to come. You know, I was more <laughs> like, here I go. You know, I, and I just kind of, I let the moments hit me. I didn't try to make moments. Mm. And, uh, and, and I was in this acting class, which I really liked which was this, uh, and it was taught by Milton Katsalas, who was a terrific man and teacher, interesting fucking guy. Uh, but he was a Scientologist, which I don't give a shit about, because people sometimes say, hey, who do you study with? You know, and I'd say, oh, Milton, they tell, isn't he a Scientologist? I go, I heard he was, you know, he never talked about it. So I was in acting class, and Milton, from time to time, very, you know, perceptive guy. We'd be in the class, and he, and he stopped the class and he was pissed off, which was happened maybe once a month. And it was like, because this now it's a monologue for yeah. an hour. And I just want to watch scenes and, and do some shit, you know. And he's going on about you motherfucker, don't trust me. And I know I'm not here to audition. And it was like, oh no. And I'm sitting in the front row. And after about 20 minutes of this, I'm thinking, who is it back there that doesn't trust Milton? You know. <laughs> Just fucking just change your attitude. Let's get the class, you know, and I'm getting and then I start thinking, I go, you know, really, if it comes down to it, I don't really trust Milton. <laughs> and I go, hmm, what is that? That's not good. And then I thought, oh, who do I trust? I thought, oh, my 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 family, my parents, no, my friends, no, and I'm feeling like, wow, I don't trust anybody. And then I thought, well, at least I trust myself. And then I go, least of all. <laughs> and I was like, holy shit. Hmm. And uh, in the class was uh, Bodie Elfman, who was a Scientologist I knew. And for some fucking reason, I said, okay, I'm going to handle this trust shit. You know? Wow. And I thought, 
okay, I'll just do something crazy out of the blue to trust Milton. I had no idea what Scientology was. I go to Bodhi after class. I say, give me some book on Scientology. I want to find out. I want to try Scientology. And I read this whole book. I said, and, and I had done drugs like when I was a kid, you know, younger. And, uh, and I felt that they had like left them. They, they, you know, took some of the shine off of me and that I, that I didn't, you know, and, and, and I, and this thing's claimed it could get the drugs out of your body that from when, you know, and did that, you read Dianetics? Is that what they gave you to read? No, he gave me this book called what is Scientology? It's like okay. this thick. It's a lot of pictures, but I went through the whole thing and I called him the next morning. I said, take me over to that fucking castle in Hollywood. Let's try this shit. I want to try this thing where you take niacin and you sweat and it's supposed to get the drugs out. Let me try. And that's how I got into Scientology. And how long were you in it? 12 years. But when you go and do that, that's home, a lot of getting drugs the, out. The niacin and all of that. No, is I, that, that cost? That was, is that like I mean, a $10,000 thing? Like, how do they no, get? I, I don't much, understand no, how they get was, everybody. I mean, I, the thing with Scientology is, you know, for, I'm never going to talk about like somebody's religion. You know, it's it's. I'm I'm not a I'm not really personally into organized religion, but you know, at all. But you know, if somebody is, it's up to them, you know. And and it might be useful to you at the time, you know. And it may be right. you you may move on afterwards. But I also you know it's you're not going to change anybody's mind by telling them they're stupid, you know. <laughs> so. You know, you, people have to discover these things themselves. Um, my problem with Scientology, you know, I'm not going to get it. I mean, what I kind of fought against when I lo- left it was not, I, you know, what you believe is your business. I had a problem with the superstructure of the organization. You know, I'm not into stuff where they were taking advantage of people, hurting people that I thought, uh I wasn't okay with. So I kind of, I, that's what I stood up to. You know, I have my own, you know, I, I, you know, part of it, but you know, again, I got a lot out of it, even just, you know, I, in terms of like, when I look back on my life, I don't regret anything because it was all useful. Mm -hmm. You know, even like, you know, sometimes you got to, bang your head against a wall to realize there's a wall there but then right. if you realize there's a wall and you can climb over it go around or lean against it or whatever you want to do but so the only thing i kind of regret is smoking you know mm-hmm. I, I, smoking is stupid but you know the rest of the stuff it, it got me to because what i was going to say is when I when I was I was so disillusioned and, and confused when I got out, I didn't know what's my thoughts and what's, you know, and oh my God, I was in a cult. How does that happen? I don't see myself like that and all this kind of shit. But, you know, it, it, it I from that in order to kind of get myself out of it, I adapted this kind of policy that from now on, the only thing I know is that I don't know. And it, and 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 it, and and so because I, I I had to like think when I'm reacting to something is that my reaction, or is it something I've adapted from Scientology or from school or society or mom and dad or what, you know? Because I feel like my whole thing is that the best thing you can be is you, you know. And we always try to get to be somebody else or be a version that we think is better. But you right fucking now is perfect. Doesn't mean there's not room for improvement. On the improvement note, let's take a little bit of break and we'll we'll come back with uh, Jason and dive into one of the things that he is best at, which is uh, being a father and ask him about that a little bit. Oh, God. (laughs) We're better together with Ann and Heather. And we're back. And we're back. Oh, Heather, why, why don't you take it away? <laughs> yeah, talk to us a little bit about your kids and about the struggles of working from, you know, Chicago and 
you know, I think that's a thing for any actor. I know I've seen Anne struggle with it when, you know, you, ha- you have to leave your family oftentimes to support your family. So yeah. you want to talk a little bit about that? It's, uh, I, I can't say I'm an expert. And I, 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 I can tell you that when I look at it, you know, I suspect that there's a lot I justify. And I don't know whether it's, if it's a valid justification or not, you know, but um, I, 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 because of Scientology, I have this job, you know, because when I left, uh, they kind of came after me and attacked me and, uh, you know, sued me. And I, and I'm like, fuck that shit. I'm going to fight, you know, and I fought and fought and, you know, and I, and, and they draw it out and their whole plan really, and it's even written in their policy is just to, you know, they don't have to win the lawsuit. They just want to ruin you. Right. And, and um, at any rate, I was too stubborn to do that. And I, and it just didn't seem right. But then all of a sudden for the first time, I'm like 50 years old, 50 something and all for the first time in my life, I'm like broke. And I thought, oh shit, I, I got to get a job. I got to, I got to get a series. Wow. You know, and I was hoping to get a series like, uh, you know, be like number eight on the call sheet. Cause I'm, you know, I tell you, I'm lazy, <laughs> you know? So I started like focusing on acting, but from that, I actually started really focusing, like working hard cause I'm capable at it. I knew I was good at it, but I just never. And, uh, and it was at, it, when I turned 50, because I probably left that organization like 48, 49, something like that, I guess. I can't, I'm, I'm not good with timing, but I, 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 when I really started to, to attack my own life and, and, you know, that I have to make money and to do that, I have to act. So I have to, you know, I got engaged in it. Um, it was actually, I realized for the first time in my life when I was almost 50 and I'd been working for 25 years that, oh my God, I'm an actor. Cause I always wondered, what am I going to do when I grow what up? What am I going to be when I grow I'll up? I'll do this yeah. for now. And, 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 and I, and I like acting and I, and so I really started to kind of really, I mean, I knew that's what I did for a living. I wrote it on my tax return, but I always <laughs> felt like, you know, what am I really going to do? You know? And, and, uh, uh, and, and, and so all that stuff came as a, as a reaction to that. And mm-hmm. I had, you know, children now and I had home and I had all this, so I had to make money and, and I thought, okay, I'm going to get a series and do that thing. And I, and I, I even, I mean, I could go on forever, but you know, I even, I wanted to get a Dick Wolf series. I decided, you know. And Not everybody has the same result you do, Jason, when they say I want to do a series and I want it to be a Dick Wolf series and I want to be the lead of it. Well, so congrats on that. You got quite a mind, be, buddy. I think you got a shamrock in your pocket. <laughs> well, I, uh, yeah, I'm, I'm lucky. But I, I, you know what I feel like? I feel like, you know, whatever. I don't know if this is true for everybody, but I suspect it is deep down. But it's true for me. I know. I believe anyway, is that whatever I set my mind to, I will do. And that's why, from my experience, I very rarely set my mind. (laughs) Because, you know, you, a lot of times you set your mind out of things that are not necessarily you, but your ego. You know, oh, I want to be famous or I want to, you know, this fancy car or this kind of a love life or whatever. And you you, so you 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 can do that, but you don't realize that it's the cause. So I try to get out of the way of what I want, Mm. you know, and be open to what. I want. You know. Yeah. You see? I think I don't think you're lazy. I just think you streamline your energy in the right place. 
is. <laughs> well, no, I'm not lazy now. Fuck, I work my ass off. Yeah, I mean, it, I, uh, I, I, I don't know if everyone knows, but being the lead of a, of a one hour drama is most likely the most difficult job in acting there is. It's a 17 hour day trek through the week. And by the time you get to Friday and it's four o'clock in the morning and you're getting off set and your eyes are bleary and bloody from not only from the from the uh, special effects you guys have. Yeah, that's set, right. Oh, but but right. Um, the amount of the amount of uh, work and, and dedication you put in and that comes with sacrifices and you have to take the jobs where they come and um jason was living in los angeles and and had a family and uh you have two sons and uh, the sacrifice that you make is well shoot i said I'm, i want a dick wolf series i forgot it was in chicago i yeah. guess i gotta go <laughs> yeah there's always uh, there and that give and take and i and i was um lucky enough to be with you at a moment where where you were able to uh, take a break and celebrate your children. You took them to Mexico, as I recall, and, and, and got, I, I think I, I'm going to take some credit for encouraging you to spend some of your fucking money. Like what is yeah. wrong with you? Go. I mean, why are you living in a hovel? And what, what like, what I'm, I'm going to take responsibility for you actually That's purchasing true. your property. Yes. Um, but uh, the, the heart uh, of the parent never changes from wanting to, be able to have done both, uh, be there every day for their kids and, and, and work. And you, you just, you just can't. And that trip I, uh, remember was kind of life changing for, for you and has, has created uh, a deepening of our friendship through that journey with your, with your, with your sons and how excited you were. And I'd love for you to talk about your sons a little bit and bear and, and what has happened in the last, uh, year uh, that you are celebrating, uh, now. Well, I, uh, I have two boys that are, uh, my mother always used to say to the mother crow, her baby crow is always the blackest, <laughs> but uh, I'm very pleased with who they are as human beings. They're, they're, they're good people and they're empathetic and, and decent. And, uh, and I'm I'm excited to see how they unfold. Um, maybe this is a justification also, but and I'll, I'll, I, maybe I've gone off subject. But I just, but uh, you know, and you know, you and I were actors, and and sometimes you have to go away. And um, the best thing you can give your kids is you, you know, and sometimes, mommy isn't being for mommy or daddy to be who they are. They're not at home, you know, but it, 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 it that's you see all that. I, I, do you follow where I'm going with this? I, I can't really yes. articulate it. And, uh, but like, I wished I'd been there with them more. Like I missed living with them on a daily basis, nine years. You know, Bix is now 18, so he was 11 when I left. And, uh, oh no, he was nine, right? He's 18 and Bear was, he was five years old, mm -hmm. you know? But we really got, the time that we could spend together became more valuable. Mm -hmm. and uh and it's interesting like i think where Anne is going is that you know and there was a divorce and that was not fun for any of us and i was always worried that it was hard on my kids you know so i i tried to like you know what can i do to to ease the the pain which is you know but what an honor and what a kind of joy and but bear uh, my youngest for the last couple of years has been adamant that he wanted to to come to chicago and live with me and go to high school here which seemed uh, an impossible dream and uh largely because of his charisma and kind of setting his mind to things 
<laughs> I wonder where I got that from. Yeah, but, uh, you know, it, it kind of miraculously, uh, two weeks ago, he moved here. And he's finishing off eighth grade here, and uh, we're applying to school, and uh, and I feel very uh, confident that uh, he's made the right move for him, you know? And it's certainly the right move for me because, you know, after nine years, you, you get weary. And, and I frankly feel like I'm good for another 100,000 miles right now. Wow. And you yeah. need somebody other than yourself to, you know, take in uh, that apartment and how huge it is, your your beautiful new space, which we can see a, a little bit of a, a gorgeous. I was I was uh, there the day that you purchased that. And I was so uh, excited for you. I don't know why I kept wanting you to spend your money. I was just like, come on, no, you right. if, if no, I get you... back on this show, I want to I want to see your apartment. But <laughs> no, but you know what, though, it's you. You were right. You were right. I needed to. And, what did you and, say and, you know, to him? No, what I did was, she say? I was, I, listen, Heather, <laughs> I was like, I lived in a very small furnished apartment that had been a cop's apartment. And I, I, I moved into it sight unseen before the first season. So you, and were, I you just, were staying in character even out of. <laughs> well, I just, I just, I don't go out. Yeah. I don't. I, and, you know, Anne will tell you how busy it is. And, and, well, if you uh, don't go out, you really need a nice apartment. <laughs> well, you know what? And, you know, my therapist was like, Jason, you got to move. You know, and <laughs> Anne was right. And the vacation and all these things. It's you. You're completely right. They were things that I needed to do. And and uh, I just uh, I'm happy I have. And, and like I have a wonderful space. And Bix, my older son, he got on the red eye and he arrived here this morning. Oh, terrific. And my brother and his husband are coming over for dinner any minute. And we're going to have a little family time, you know, that. And I'm just like. Happy. You That's are you're just beaming. You are just beaming from ear to ear. And I'm I'm so grateful to see that. And we we want to end with a with a with a little uh, prayer, as I know that um, Bear is. um is applying to my alma mater, which I cannot believe, St. Francis W. Parker, and it changed uh, it changed my life. And one of one of the first stories I think I, I told you in the freezing cold in Chicago when we were shooting was uh, that Francis Parker had had saved my life. I was discovered there. Well, you walked in, for for those of you who don't know the story. She walked in to Francis Parker and said, "I need to sign up for high school," and the headmaster said well, do you know that this is a private school? And Anne said, well, what's a private school? And they said, well, it costs money. And Anne said, well, I, I don't have any of that. <laughs> and she walked you down to her office and said, let's sit down and talk about it. And and she gave you a full scholarship. And And when you think about you know, how things line up when you were talking about, you know, had your brother not dated that lawyer, who knows where, you yeah. know, when you when you see the course of your life, that was one step that and and then look, you're you got into acting, of course, because you were discovered in a play at Francis Parker. And then your nieces and nephews all yes. went through Francis Parker and now have, you know, these beautiful artistic careers. And uh, and let's hope Bear does that same walk. And I, I got a feeling. I, 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 well, I mean, if they we'll don't see. let the most Chicagoey guy in uh, town, I mean, kid, uh, I mean, into uh, Francis let's, Parker, let's be honest, yeah. I think Ann yeah. H might come for them. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. Jason, it has been such a pleasure to have you on. One of the things that we do on this show is to um, ask a, a little bit of a, uh, we're doing a special thing with our with our guests that will be as, um, its own uh, separate show and its own show. But do you want to talk about it, our generation? So we're, we think that I it's a- I love your it, hair, Anne. I love your hair. Like she just you cut it. I just yeah. cut it all off. Fucking thank you. I love it. Oh, I thank love you. It. Go ahead. What thing? Okay, so- <laughs> Thank so, you. <laughs> to get advice from per, some, from somebody who's just gone through the generation. So in other words, I'm 50. So I would give advice to somebody in their 40s. So like what advice uh, would you either give to yourself or to somebody a decade below you? So that would be you because I just okay. turned 60. I'm listening. Oh, happy birthday. 
Well, that was that's the first 51. time she's ever admitted she's 50 Jason yeah. I don't know what you bring out of people uh, but honestly I, I it say. is the first time she has ever not said that she's in her late 40s so I want to say congrats you so you popped her cherry early she just for the first time admitted she's 50 thank okay. you Jason well you know what I admitted it I'm I, gonna say it all day I'm gonna say it all day I, I'll tell you what I said because I didn't think they aired this part of it when we're talking uh, oh, about oh, it. Yeah, she's gonna tell our producers to cut it oh, I don't okay. care I'm fucking 50 so what is the advice that you would give to Heather Jason? <laughs> well, you too. You're 51, bro. Uh, I know. See, she has you to call it out that I'm older. Is, uh, let me see. Like, what would you like to have known 10 years ago? I, I'm, I'm afraid I'm going to disappoint you. Uh, doubtful. I, I can definitely I say you've never you, disappointed listen, me once. I don't think today is going to be the day. Um, You know, 50, 40, 30, 20, 10, birth, death. It's a life. And hopefully, and I imagine that this is true for you. That's my strong feeling that, you know, you're on a journey. And, uh, you know, there's years that go by, we measure it in time, you know, but the only thing that, you know, the real thing that, you you know, your body changes, you know, it starts to get creaky, but, and you have a persona, you know, Heather, I'm Jason, you're Anne, and people identify with me as that, but I look at that more as, a car and you know sometimes we get a cool car like i think we all have pretty nice cars relative to other people you know but they break down a little sometimes you got to put them in the shop and eventually you get rid of them and but you're the you're not the car you're the guy driving the car and and you'll get a new car i don't know if that's i don't care what you know i don't i don't I'm not telling you, you know, another body or, or heaven or, I don't know, but I, I think I told him, you know, I died in, in once. So I had a bad car accident. Not my body. I, I mean, and I know you're you. And, uh, you know, that's something that is on a bigger evolution. Mm. And, and, you know, Heather and Ann and Jason are ways for us to interact with each other and, and feed us and you, you know? And uh, so, you know, you obviously take good care of your car, you know, it's a beautiful car. And, uh, you know, I imagine it's, uh, it, 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 it'll probably be a beautiful vintage car in 30 years, you know? <laughs> uh, but the driver, that's 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 the ticket. Makes sense. Yes. I love it. I I, I just want to say thank you for bettering us today, Jason. I, I you know I adore you, and I'm now now I'm now I'm, Heather adores you, and we, <laughs> it's it's been so lovely to talk to you, and so um, nice to. Uh, see your car. <laughs> Please um, enjoy your family. Enjoy tonight. your family and your family dinner. Thank you for sharing some of your uh, Saturday and 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 love to Bix and Bear and all the all our best. Thank you for bettering us today. Love, I feel love so you. Love. Thanks. Love you. Thank Bye. You. Bye. Bye. Until next time, everybody, live in loving kindness and don't be a dick. Woo. Uh, oh, we love you. We're better together with Anne and Hay. Well, thanks for listening today. I think it's, it marks a very um, particular moment for me because Heather admitted that she's 50, 50, 50. She's 52. I'm not 52. I'm, I'm 50. Barely. Barely. You're 50. I'm barely 50. Jason McGay popped her cherry today. Day. Heather is officially 50. Yeah. I'm going to give you shit all day, shit all day for being right. 50. That Francis Parker let her bet. Better <laughs> let that kid in the school, too. Hey Amen. Let's get buried to Francis Parker. <laughs> Thanks for listening, everybody. Hey. 
And a big, big thanks to our Better Together team. That's Ryan Tillotson, Sebastian Alcala. And you, Elizabeth Keener. Oh, thanks, Ryan. And, of course, Ann and Heather. We're better together with Ann and Heather. Straw Hut Media.